Um, so by training, I'm a social scientist. Um, I have a bachelor degree in history and international relations and a master's in international relations. And then I did a PhD at Berkeley in environmental science policy and management. So in a sense, the, uh, the opening to different disciplines that are today concerned with mountains came fairly early for me. Uh, even though uh, the reason why I ended up doing my PhD on mountains was somewhat of a, of a, of a historical accident. I was initially interested in forest policy, uh, but then I moved to the US just after 9-11, uh, wanting to study forest policy in Canada and the US, but then for political reasons, personal reasons, I had to move back to, to Europe. And so I decided to change from forests to mountains um, and from Canada to Switzerland. So I ended up comparing forest policy in, uh, in Switzerland and in the Sierra Nevada in, uh, in California. And so from, from a social scientific uh, perspective, my question was always, um, of course, geographers start with that too, but what is a mountain? Um, I mean, there are different definitions of, of, of mountains and we know that different scientists define them differently. Is it about elevation, roughness of terrain? Is it about different uh, biological uh, habitats we, we find? But from the perspective of a political scientist, for me, the question was always and continues to be, how does a mountain or a mountain region become uh, important to politics? Um, and so through this, I got involved in studying regional development policies first at the national level in Switzerland and California. And then naturally, because I stayed in, in, uh, in Europe, I, I started looking more at transboundary uh, mountain regions. Um, and so for the last 10, 15 years, I would say I have studied regional mountain governance uh, in the Alps, in the Pyrenees, in the Jura, in the Carpathians, um, in, uh, in the Caucasus, uh, in the Andes, and always from the perspective of why do societies um, decide to accord a special role to mountains? Um, for what reasons? Um, how do they translate that concern into policies? And what uh, consequences does that have um, for societies, for populations who live in mountain regions and for you know, resources in mountains that are used in, in different ways. So today I'm, I'm the, uh, the, the chair of the Mountain Research Initiative, which is um, a global network of mountain researchers from all different disciplines, uh, an organization that exists for more than 15 years now and, and has a, uh, as its objective to, to promote uh, knowledge about mountains, coordination uh, about uh, coordination of science uh, on, on mountains, but also uh, promoting young generations of um, students who get interested in mountains, and also try to have an influence on uh, on policy issues that concern mountains, whether that's in the area of climate change or uh, biodiversity or or other issues. I think one of one of the things that interested me a lot about mountains and that continue to to intrigue me is that um, mountains are often represented as something that we look at from a distance. They're the beautiful peaks with uh, snow covered uh, mountains. Uh, but once we start to think more about uh, what mountains are and where they are, we realize and we learn things like mountains cover uh, more than a quarter of the Earth's uh, land surface. They provide over half of uh, fresh water for humanity. They contain a quarter roughly of all terrestrial biodiversity. Um, almost a billion people worldwide live in mountain regions. 20% um, of global tourism is in mountains. And almost a quarter of all the world's forests are in mountains. So in a sense, mountains are everywhere. And because they are everywhere uh, in very diverse uh, socioeconomic situations, they also uh, are of, uh, of importance for very different uh, reasons. And, and, and these reasons, some of them are, are the same in uh, developing countries uh, than in developed countries. Some are, 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 are different. Um, but if we take, for instance, the, uh, the, the categorization of uh, 
ecosystem services that was developed in the context of the uh, Millennium Ecosystems Assessment. Um, and you go through the four categories, you realize that mountains are important to society in all areas. So, you know, they talk about provisioning services. So mountains, uh, you know, are home and, and, and provide for food, fresh water, fuel, wood, genetic resources. Uh, mountains are important in, in regulating services, so they have an influence on how climate works. Um, mountains, they block clouds when clouds move across the landscape. Where the clouds are blocked, there's water that falls, so there's an important regulating function. Also for, for floods, uh, because depending on, on, on the steepness and the elevation, you have different um, gravity uh, regimes, and that has an influence uh, on how uh, water is distributed and what impact it has in the lowlands. Um, there's an important cultural importance of mountains, and this is something that often comes up in, in my research because we we find that mountains, uh, and, and I say this also because I'm Swiss, but mountains play can play an important role in the in the cultural identity of a of a country uh, for different reasons because they are you know, in some countries mountains are sort of symbols of, of the pure life, the good life, uh, but they can also be uh, you know, a, a symbol for, for protection from threats from, from elsewhere. Uh, at the same time that they can be through the, the mountain passes, uh, connections to other countries. So they're important spiritual, uh, recreational, aesthetic uh, services that mountain provides. Um, and I think for the, for the natural uh, scientists, uh, a fourth category of services that's very important is the, what they call the supporting services. So soil formation, uh, nutrient cycling, uh, primary production of resources. So across the spectrum, I think uh, mountains are important for society. Um, it's perhaps easy to say it, uh, but it's often more difficult to translate that into policy. Uh, Um, I, th I think there, there are two different ways of looking at mountains. One way is to consider mountains as territory where different sectors come together. And there we would be concerned about how mountain regions um, become embedded in uh, international or national policies. So we could look at things like, uh, do we have protected areas in mountain regions? transboundary protected areas, but also within countries. Do individual countries have regional development policies that, um, that give a special status to mountains, like we have in France uh, or in Switzerland? And the other way to look at mountains is for the, for the resources uh, that we find in mountains or the activities that take place in mountains. And so you could look at you know, the role of mountains uh, in agriculture policy or energy policy or uh, tourism policy. And I would say that from the perspective of the, from the second perspective, the more sectoral uh, perspective, it's, uh, it, it varies, of course, uh, around the world. Uh, but I think uh, the attention given to mountains is way larger than in the first perspective with mountains as a territory. And, and we see this as well in the, uh, in, the, um, in the international policy agenda. I mean, in 1992, at the Rio summit, we got a chapter on mountains in Agenda 21, which called attention to the special needs and the, uh, the, the, the fragility of, of mountain regions. Uh, we had in 2001, what we call the International Year of Mountains, uh, that was designated by the UN. Uh, and today we have the 2030 agenda with 169 targets and 230, et cetera, indicators. And you look at, if, if you look at where mountains appear there, one could say, and a lot of uh, mountain researchers are not satisfied with this, uh, you find them in, mentioned in two or three targets. Um, and, and that is not, it, it's in a way it's disappointing. But again, from the from the from the more sectoral perspective, you have to realize that you know poverty and hunger are uh, the first two goals of the SDGs, uh, 
and insofar as a lot of um, you know marginalized peoples um, uh, live in mountain areas you could say there is attention to mountains it's just less explicit as if we had the term uh, mountain uh, mountain attached so i think it varies quite a lot and and it has changed over time too um, i think that the 2001 uh, international year of mountains um, was a trigger for a lot of activity uh, around mountain policy. So you had a number of countries in, uh, in the Caucasus, for instance, but elsewhere also, that, that initiated a, a dialogue on mountain policy. Um, and that has evolved in, in different ways. And of course, different countries have served as inspiration for that. Um, but I think there's, a, there's still an awareness that mountains are both territories where some integrated approach is necessary and mountains as uh, you know uh, collections of resources that uh, for better or worse can be used for uh, the benefits of uh, of society i think today um, mountains are becoming more important again uh, maybe we'll, we'll discuss that in a in a moment uh, and uh, one of the main reasons for this is climate change, of course, which over the last 20, 25 years has changed everything, I would say. Um, the connection is one that is very political because in, in many places, mountain regions are, um, are in border areas uh in many countries uh the political systems are such that uh, you know peripheral areas uh have always some historical ambition to be independent so the the you know admitting in your policy system a special role of mountains creates or or can create a separation in the country that may not be, you know, uh, advantageous um, for the, you know, for the for the development of, of that country. Now, can you have proper recognition of mountain issues in countries where you don't have a regional development policy? I think so. Uh, and and you know, proof for that is that in in some of the countries I know for for Switzerland at least. Um, concern for for mountains emerged in particular sectors and in this case it was the forestry sector because at the end of the 19th century um, societies realized that uh, you know if we cut off all the forests then we have more floods um, so forest protection uh, in mountain regions was kind of a precursor of, uh, of, of mountain policy. You know, the same happened in agriculture. So you, you realize that, uh, you know, from an economic perspective, for instance, the, the amount of, of government and, and private investment too, I think that goes into sectoral concerns for mountains is by orders of magnitude greater than it does for regional, uh, regional development policies focused on mountains. I, I think the I mean climate change has uh, has an impact in in different ways in different places and and so from a, from an economic perspective you you have to first look at what kinds of activities take place in mountain regions and then how these activities are 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 impacted uh, so depending on where the mountain region is you have activities linked to tourism for instance. Now, with tourism, there's, there's been more and more research done on, on, on the impact of climate change on tourism. So on the one hand, you have areas where permanent snow disappears and areas that therefore become more accessible to um, hikers, mountain bikers, etc. Uh, but of course, with, with, uh, with, uh, with temperature increases, you also have less precipitation, less snow, uh, and therefore winter tourism is, uh, is under great threat. So on, on the tourism uh, side, if one were to only look at, um, at winter tourism, which in mountains is very important, there's probably more of a, of, of a risk than a, a, an opportunity. The opportunities is where I think 
um, actors uh, in the in the tourism sector are uh, called upon to reflect uh, on, on how they can diversify their activities, uh, which can you know bring attention to different aspects of mountains, and that can that can create lots of uh, lots of different uh, opportunities. There are of course economic activities that are related to agriculture, uh, forestry. Uh, and there you may find that certain crops suddenly grow in altitudes where they didn't grow before, but you may also find that uh, crops that would traditionally be grown at certain altitudes don't fare so well anymore because temperatures are changing. Um, so I think it varies quite, uh, quite a bit. Um, you have mining, uh, of course, which uh, which is often in, in mountain regions. And, and there I'm not an expert, but um, I would imagine that wherever there's, a, there's an economic incentive to, to develop mining activities, um, it will be done whether or not it's warm or cold. <laughs> I mean, mountains are known today to be uh, more exposed to and more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So the adaptation needs in mountain regions are probably higher than in other areas uh, of, the, of the land surface. Um, and therefore, the, uh, the, the challenges in, in, in mountain regions are greater. Now, for governance uh, purposes, that means, on the one hand, that there are uh, increased resource needs to deal with, uh, you know, to, to, to manage risk. Um, but there's also an increased uh, need for um, locally meaningful solutions. Uh, and there, from a governance perspective, it depends on very much on, on how much autonomy, uh, how much flexibility uh, you know, mountain regions have to adapt solutions to their needs. Um, so it's, it's difficult to, to make a general statement, um, but you find um, you know, you find areas that will probably be depopulated simply because there are neither the resources nor the political leverage to do much about the, the impact of climate change. Um, there are other regions where climate change may, uh, you know, bring opportunities, including economic opportunities, and the, the, the polit political system is such that the mountain region can take advantage of them. Um, so they, uh, their resilience is in, in increased uh, because they have those uh, those resources. There, there's a huge diversity in in, uh, in, in mountain regions around the world uh, for a number of different reasons, and, and, and part of that diversity uh, comes from the fact that when we talk about mountains, we talk about the integration of concerns in forestry and agriculture and mining and tourism, all these different sectors that come together, come together in different ways. Now, that's not to say that mountain regions around the world do not face similar issues, um, especially under climate change. There are typically in mountain regions increased risks of natural hazards. Um, so there is an exchange of experience that goes on with climate change and you know the, the energy transitions that we, we all strive for. Uh, there is, uh, you know, the, the common feature of mountains that they have an advantage, uh, the advantage of gravity. So, you know, building reservoirs, uh, generating uh, hydroelectric power uh, is, you know, uh, a fairly common approach to, to dealing with uh, climate change in the, in the mountains. In Switzerland, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly evident how, how this, uh, this is impacting. Um, that said, again, the diversity, I think, is also one of the reasons why we don't have, say, an international mountain convention, uh, because the, the interests and, and the issues are, 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 uh, are so diverse. What we do find, however, is certain regional uh, agreements, um, because where a number of countries share a mountain region, they have a history of, uh, of collaborating or of, of, uh, of warring with each other. Uh, and, and their concerns are more similar than they are between different mountain regions uh, around the world. 
So whether it's in the Andes or in the Jura and the Pyrenees, the Alps, the Caucasus, the Carpathians, uh, everywhere you find some kind of initiative uh, uh, linked to governance that focuses on the on the mountain region as such, um, and, and there you often find, um, you know, common approaches that uh, that bring out the character of of mountains. I mean, the Alps and the Carpathians may be the only mountain regions that have a formal treaty um, bringing the countries together, but there are some kind of governance initiative in in, uh, in many regions around the world. I think one of the one of the the interesting things about mountains too is that uh, um, while we look at mountains from a distance, we rarely reflect on where we look at them from, and where we look at them from are often from the lowlands, sometimes in the city. And uh, once you start looking into and studying uh, mountains, whether from the perspective of the natural sciences or from the from the perspective of social sciences, you realize that what's very important is the relationship between mountains and non-mountain areas. And that concerns uh, a whole range of, of, of issues. One, in fact, uh, is you know, heritage. Um, and again, we can, you know, we can mention uh, climate change as a, as a sort of driving factor, but you know, very simply stated, as uh, as temperatures increase and life in cities becomes more and more unbearable, um, people will look more and more to places where they can, uh, you know, where they can rest. Um, I think we're not anywhere close to going back to the period of the late 19th century where we had these big resorts and chateaus developing in mountain areas. But I think there is. You know, there's there's a discussion about the the, the health benefits uh, of of mountains, uh, and uh, we have a history of you know spas and, and health establishments in mountains. And I think the 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 relationship between uh, mountain and non-mountain areas, from that perspective, is very important um, because uh, for urban dwellers, uh, mountains become more visible and more more important. Um, as a result of, of climate change. The other area that you mentioned, uh, resources, is also quite, uh, quite important from the perspective of relations between mountain and non-mountain areas, because urban dwellers, um, but also the agricultural sector in, in lowland areas, uh, benefits a lot from, from water that comes um, from mountain regions. And you know, the way a mountain region is managed uh has an influence on the quality and the quantity of of the water uh, and so i think there's there's an interest from you know populations in, in urban centers to to look well after mountains in in one way or another that doesn't have to be in a in a patronizing uh, way um, you know, we often speak about you know a partnership that needs to be developed between populations in mountain regions and populations in non-mountain regions in order for everybody to to uh, to benefit and, 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 and hopefully live in a more sustainable society. Um, yeah, insofar as, as mountains are more exposed to climate change impacts than non-mountain areas, um, not in general, but they stand out in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the the above average uh, temperature increases that we that we find in mountains, um, adaptation issues um, clearly come to mind um, because the impact of climate change on the disappearance of glaciers, um, on the uh, the melting of permafrost, uh, on the change of um, of uh, of ecosystems because there is less uh, space to move for species. Um, means that the adaptation requirements in mountain regions are, are also quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite pronounced. Um, and I think probably on the, um, on, the, uh, on the international but also the national policy agendas, um, the issue area that comes to mind first is uh, natural hazards um, because they are, 
uh, as we see in many places, they are you know unexpected. They're spectacular. Uh, they often lead to loss of uh, human life and, uh, and property. Uh, but there are slower changes too, which provide um, perhaps more time to adapt, but are 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 quite fundamental uh, at the same time. I think with the um, where where mountain regions become uh, important from the perspective of mitigation. Of course, we can say you know there's almost a billion people who live in mountain regions. So if they all emit a little bit, a little less CO2, then we're all better off. Uh, but I think it's it's from the perspective of of uh, transitioning out of um, fossil fuels that mountain regions are 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 of interest because. Um, for hydropower uh, generation, um, not just to to generate electricity uh, when the water flows down, but also to store water uh, so that electricity can be produced when it's needed. Um, in some mountain areas, there's also a lot of wind, so there's a high potential for uh, for for wind energy. Um, there's also a high potential for for solar uh, energy generation, and these, of course, are are mitigation um, actions because they will reduce CO two emissions from fossil fuel production uh, production elsewhere. I I left my home country uh, of Switzerland uh, when I was nineteen and have moved around the world for. For, for all the time since. And, and, and one of the things that I've learned is that uh, whenever I came to a new place, uh, what helped me uh, feel comfortable is to try to view the situation through the eyes of the people who I meet. Um, and mountains to me have become sort of a, a, a symbol for forcing me to see, see things in a different way. Mountains are often um, economically, politically, culturally marginalized. Uh, from the moment you start to interest yourself for mountain regions, you're forced to, um, to, to, to develop some, some, some empathy, some sympathy, some passion um, for the perspectives of those who are in a minority. Uh, and I think this is no, from from a scientific perspective, it's interesting because you don't study something that everybody else studies. Uh, but also from a personal perspective, I think it's uh, you know it's a, it's a, it's a humbling experience, uh, and one that uh, you know that that I find you know uh, that I find extremely uh, enriching uh, from an interdisciplinary perspective, uh, but also from the perspective of um, you know the the social uh, dimension of, uh, of what we do in our professional lives. Um, so it's a nice bridge between the, the personal and the professional studying mountains. I can only recommend you do the same.